uh, you know, because there's a lot going on. I do think, like, things going in my mind is like, do I really need God? The answer is yes, right? We can answer, yeah, I need him. Uh, and then I'm kind of thinking, like, you get so invested in this world, you almost can't even see the kingdom of God. Like, I get so invested in this life. I was at Scottsdale. There, there we go. We'll start there. I was at Scottsdale, North, North, Arizona, and uh, at a church, not a church conference, at a work conference, and it was great. And it was like 8.30 at night. I decided to go on a walk on this path, and it's filthy rich. People are rich there. I mean, the houses are, are huge. And I'm walking down the path, and I'm like looking through these windows. It sounds creepy, but I'm not like close I'm like far away looking, and they're in their kitchen, and I'm like, what are they doing? Because the houses are huge. You've got to kind of, I mean, they don't have the blinds shut. Uh, so I'm walking, and I'm looking at these houses, and uh, the people I work with and all that, you know, I just talk to them, and, you know, I, I don't know. Sometimes you just think, do we even need them? Because we have everything. That's kind of how I was thinking. It's like, even me, I'm like, if I get sick, I can run to the doctor. I can go get therapy, take some pills. I don't know. I can get bored, so I get a mountain bike and do mountain biking. Like, I just have so many things I can run to. Do I need them? Now, again, the answer is yes. We all know, yeah, I need them. Yeah, I need them. But I always, I don't know, I always seem to just invest a lot. The scripture this morning that was just hitting me, uh, just playing an audible here, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. You know, it's like the cares of the world choke out the word of God. And I feel like, is that me? I mean, I'm, I'm not rich, but my life's gotten easier and easier and easier, and I seem to get drawn in more and more and more into this world. And I just want the, God wants to loosen this grip. He wants to, he wants to, to kind of clean the house in the sense of like our grip is in this world and God's wanting to get rid of that. Now, I have this example. I don't do this, so this might not work good, but I'm gonna try it, okay? So uh, first off, what do you feel like, make, what makes you feel safe? Think about it. What makes you feel safe, secure? What are you investing in this life? What, what kind of holds your joy and affection? You know, start thinking of that. What, what makes you feel safe and secure? Okay, be all kinds of stuff. Let me see if I can do this. You don't guys, don't look, okay? Okay, we got money. This is your job, right? I love my job and it gives me what I want. It makes, like when my 401k is going up, I'm feeling safe and secure. Yes, I'm gonna be able to retire and just pick up hobbies and relax. This is, you know, it gets me what I want, right? So this might be your thing. Look at this, I, I found, my kids have this bling bling. So <laughs> this is a representation of that, right? Money. What might, might you, this might make you feel safe, right? US of A makes you feel safe and secure. And, and you're like, yeah, that's, that's what brings me kind of purpose is I'm an American, right? Uh, and it could be anything. And you think, oh, I better have babies because that makes me feel like I have something in this life, a bigger than me, whatever it is. It could be your intellect. I actually read this. It was awful. Guns, germs, and steel. I was like, I'm gonna read it, and I forgot it all. But it could be your intellect, your degree, that makes you feel safe. And it, the list goes on and on. Maybe it's that, just those great things you get to buy. These Nikes are supposedly really nice. I don't buy Nikes, but look at these. If you guys know them, you know them. And it, it could be anything. It could be entertainment. It could be your health, right? It could be your health, right? It could be your guns. <laughs> don't want to talk about that too much, <laughs> right? So it could be your gun. It could be your, your special someone, right? It could be any of this. Now, 
This is it, right? We are invested in this life. This is how I feel, right? And I'm saving. And then we come to him and we say, hey, Jesus, I feel like I'm lacking a little bit of something. Will you just add to this? Will you just add? And so we want to add Jesus around this. We want to build Jesus around this. Say, Jesus, just build yourself around this and take that lack away. Take that lack away. And I just feel like so convicted that this is me. I feel ridiculous, but let me, but just like this is me where I feel like all this stuff is what grips me and what holds on to me. And he's wanting to loosen our grip. He's wanting to get that stuff. He's saying, I want you to lose that. I want you to give it all. Do I have something else on me? Uh, But that's how I feel. I feel like I'm so invested. And then I come to him and I'm just like, I want you to be an addition to all this. And I want you to build around this rather than Jesus, I want to give this all away and build my life around you and build my life upon you. So that's what I'm thinking of like, what has you gripped? What are you gripping hold of? What makes you feel safe and secure? It could be anything. And if it's not him, what is it? What is it? We, uh, let's pray. Uh, God, I, I want to build my life on the rock. I want to build my life on you. I want to surrender more. I want to be good, good soil where, you, where the word is shared and it grows. Does it get choked out by the world? It doesn't get choked out by the things and I just get so much that I can't even see you because I'm so invested in in, in gazing and captivated by all this stuff. I want my trust to be in you. I don't want anything else to compete for you. Today, set people free. Loosen the grip. Strip away the things that need to be stripped away. God, help them to let go. Help me to let go. Please. Please. Amen. We are not alone. This is, uh, this is, there's a character in scripture that this has been speaking to me. It's the rich young ruler. He comes up to Jesus and he runs up and he bows down and, he, and he, he seems really excited, right? He runs and he bows down. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, good teacher, what must I do? What must I do? And he says, oh, you call me a good teacher, only God is good. And then he goes on and says, you must do this and that and this and that. And he starts listing the second half of the commandments. And then he goes on and he says, the rich young ruler, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I mean, there's a lot here. And, and we, could, we could say, like, this guy had the money, he had the wealth, he had the good works. I've kept all these good things. Like, he had self-confidence. He diagnosed himself. I think I know what I need. I have all this other stuff, but I know I lack something. Even in Matthew, he says, what do I still lack? So he has an awareness that he needs something, but he's pretty happy with where he's at. So when he comes to Jesus with a request, he thinks it's gonna be a small little thing where Jesus says, oh, you're doing great. Just add this little thing and then you can inherit eternal life. This is good works, right? We think if we can add just one thing to our life, my life's pretty good. I just need to add one thing for Jesus and then I can inherit eternal life. That's morality. We think we can earn our salvation. Jesus is like, no, 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 that, that's not it. Even later on, he says, who can be saved? But, but only God can save, right? You can't save yourself. And a lot of times we think we can come to Christ and say, just give me something to do. Read the Bible a little bit, go to church a little bit. Okay, that'll get me there. Or our self-confidence, where again, we're confident in our abilities, we're confident in our wisdom, we're confident in our knowledge, we're confident in our finances, we're confident in everything but him, and then he's addressing an issue where our trust is out of line. And 
So Jesus kind of blows through this guy where he, he cuts straight to the heart. And he says, I want you to go give all your money. Give it to the poor and leave. Now, he doesn't ask everybody to do that, right? Not every rich person is evil. Not every poor person is good. But he's, he's addressing where trust is. And he, here's the point. Jesus gets to decide how you come into the kingdom, not you. Jesus gets to decide how you come into the kingdom, not you. He can tell you what to get rid of. And it might offend us. Jesus' way is, is better, but it's, it can be painful. Jesus decides how you enter the kingdom. So try to imagine if he was literally here, first off, you have a couple options. You can stay at a distance and love Jesus at a distance. A lot of us do that, right? It's very safe to be like, oh, he's over there, and I just listen. Oh, wow, that's a good saying. Man, he's smart. Man, he's good. But you never get close enough to him where you really encounter him. Because when you really encounter him, there's only two options. You leave sorrowful or you cling to him captivated. So you might be at a distance and saying, man, he's good. I like that saying. Ooh, I don't really like that saying. And so you're kind of just indifferent. But God has, God's, God's wanting to address things today. And I think the thing is trust, right? The issue here is not so much money and this and that. It's where his trust is. So if you came up to Jesus today, what would he tell you to let go of? What holds such a thing in your life that if he said, let go of that, you might turn your back on him and leave sorrowful? What do I really trust in? I, um, so his identity was in the wrong thing, right? That's the, that's the main issue. And I think of the character Abraham, who was like 100 years old, and he has a son. And uh, that's the fulfillment of all the promises right there in his boy. And what does God ask him to do? Go sacrifice your son. And um, God did not want anything competing with his heart. He could see that Isaac had too much rain in his heart. He says, sacrifice him. And Abraham obeys, but obviously in the final moments, God does not have that happen. He just wanted to conquer his heart so that Christ was the biggest thing. God was the biggest thing in our lives. A.W. Tuzzer says it like this. I never intended that you should actually slay the lad. I only wanted to remove him from the temple of your heart that I might reign, and ch reign unchallenged there. God could have taken out, sorry about that. God could have taken this out on the margin of Abraham's life and worked inward to the center, but he chose rather to cut quickly to the heart and have it over in one sharp act of separation. So, identity. Your children are not meant to be your identity, your purpose, your value, your worth, your security. Your money is not meant to be. Your country is not meant to be. Your sexual status is not meant to be. Your health is not meant to be. Nothing except Christ alone is meant to be your worth, your value, your identity, your security, your hope. This is hard. This is not easy for me. I, we grew up uh, on like a little country, not a country, a country farm thing. Uh, and we had a zip line, like a 250 foot zip line. And you would climb up this tree like 25 feet. You'd grab these little handlebars like Home Alone and you would just rip, and it was like a ride. It was a trip. Who's ridden on that zip line? Give me hands. Oh, yeah, a few of us here back in the day. Who had injuries from that? Anybody? 
But here's the deal, you'd get on that and it was a blast, it was a thrill. But what happens at the end? There's a tree and you do not want to hit it. It murders people. That's what it does. It's doom and destruction right there. and You're headed towards it. You love the ride. So we realized very quickly, we need something to uh, not hit that. So we got mattresses, we piled them up, got hay bales, we piled them up. It was very obvious where you needed to let go so you would not die and be murdered. And so we would go and you'd jump into this mattress and it was so fun. And uh, so people would come over and we'd be like, okay, when you see the hay bales and the mattress, let go or you will die. And we'd even have them repeat. I remember Tyler, I will let go if, not this Tyler, but I will let go when I see the mattresses. Okay, great. Guess what? They never let go. <laughs> I promise. He cracked ribs. It was like, ah, bam. And we're like, let go, let go when you see the mattresses. He never let go and he went right into that tree. I mean, broken feet, people broke feet because they would always let go after the mattress, right? Because they realized, well, there's death. I better let go. Now, they got so bad, we had to tie a rope to it and run with people and then just slow them down and say, all right, you can let go now. Uh, and it was exhausting. Okay, what's the point of this? There's a point, okay? It's what we hold on to, we feel like safe in that. We feel like we have control of that. And if it's in our hands, we feel like we can control it and it's safe. But the reality is, God is calling us to let go when, when we see him, right? When we hear his words and we're, 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 we're so thrilled with the ride until we start realizing, oh wait, there's something after this. There's something after this. And God's saying, let go. I mean, the truth is, I'm not, I, no one can run with you and stop you before you get to the end and say, okay, let go here. You know, there's messengers that say, let go when you see Christ. Let go when you hear Christ. And, and the point is, is only when you're in Christ are you safe. Only when you're in Christ are you safe. And there's so many things that we don't want to let go of that we grip on so tight to and that are competing for our hearts. And God is saying, I want you to let go and fall into my hands where you will be safe. And again, I think some today will encounter Christ and I, I, we just, we wanna say, let go when you see him. And, and if you see Christ today and if you, you're sensing his presence today, to just say, God, I wanna I want give up. I wanna let go of my control. I wanna let go of the things I hold so tightly and, and fall into you. So we're all on the zip line, first of all. Some of us think we're, we're Christians a long time, right? And we're like, ah, we'll let the, we'll let the young ones run. I, I gave up enough. Uh, here's the deal. We're, there's all, we always have our hands in something that when we come near to Christ, he'll say, get rid of that. That's taken a little too much. You never get to this perfect. Paul says in Philippians, like, I'm striving to get to perfection. I haven't made it, never will, but I'm striving for that. So it's not like we graduate, people. And we think, okay, God has all my heart. Um, any of this speaking to you guys? I hope so. I mean, I, sorry if it's rough, but I just, uh, my heart, I just want to give more. Like, that's my thing. I just want to give more today. And I don't want to just live at a distance with Christ. I want to, like, go near to him. So again, the, when you've come near to Christ, there's two responses, right? You either are captivated by him and cling to him, or you go away sorrowful. So he offers a better way, but that better way can hurt because he, he will say things to you that let go of that you don't want to let go of. And this could be, it could even mean you, you get persecution and rejected by your nearest and dearest. It could be that your heart is broken and he cuts heartstrings and you go serve and go tell the gospel in other lands. I mean, it surely means telling and sharing your gospel and being regarded as a fool here and now. When he says to the Christian, you come follow me. 
He's saying, come pick up my cross. He's saying, come pick up the cross and follow me. You must lose your life to find it. Salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life, Bonhoeffer, who is essentially a martyr for Christ. Um, C.T. Studd, he was this guy who was a missionary to India, China, and Africa. He was born with like a silver spoon in his mouth, filthy rich, was one of the greatest cricket players of all time in his day at 16 years old, had a huge future, and uh, God changed his life. He, he heard, let go, and he let go. He let go of it all. He gave all his money except $3,400, and then his soon-to-be wife was like, hey, remember what God said to the rich young ruler? I think he's saying that to us. So he gave that $3,400 away, and him and his wife had no penny to their name and gave up his career. Um, and he said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. And it just reminds me of Paul where he says, I counted all as loss for the sake of knowing Christ. I even want to read that. But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For this sake, I, I suffer the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. I just really, what I'm saying, I guess today, is that we all have a hold of something and if you would come near to Christ, I mean, yeah, he, he might blow away your self-confidence, your morality, that I'm good, I'm this and that. I just don't want you, I guess I don't want you to turn your back on him. Because what happens here? And Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I just don't want us to turn our back on him. Because when we turn our back on him, all we know is sorrow. All, all we know is lack. All we know is not sorrow for a day, but a sorrow for eternity. For eternity. I mean, Judas turned his back on him, and he said he went him out in the night and committed suicide. I mean, the reality is when we turn our back on him, it's like committing spiritual suicide. And you just keep turning your back. Because he, he, you come near sometimes and you hear something you don't want to hear and you turn your back. You're, you hold it on so tight, he says, let go. I don't want to let go. I don't want to let go. Sorrow, destruction is at the end of that path. Christ is here in this room and he's calling out to you. He says he loves you. He doesn't leave you as orphans. He comes near to you. Don't turn your back on him. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Um, band, come up. I, I mean, I, <laughs> come on up, guys. Oh, man. So I know God is wanting to strip things out of my life. And I think when we come near to Christ, he just has a way of doing that, where he, he strips things away. And for many of us, again, if you don't know Christ, I, just, I want you to go to him in these moments as we sing, Run to him, bow down to him, look at his face. I mean, cry out to him. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Your blood was shed for me. I mean, it was shed for you. One request I have, one request that you would forgive me, save me, wash me clean, like just save me. That's your one request. That's your one request. Save me. 
He calls you and says, come. Tell him, I'm, I'm coming to you. God's at the door and he knocks, but he won't tear it down. He wants you to come and open the door. And again, this, this is not just for, for you. It's for all of us. It's, it's for all that have been walking with Christ. There are things that he's knocking and saying, open the door to this area in your life because you don't want him to have it. You don't want him to have it. This is my safety and security. Any of this stuff, this is where I feel safe. This is where I feel secure. God's like, no, I want you to give that all. Give it all. Give it all and follow me. This is the call. And none of us want to do this. And you think, how can I do this? I don't have a grip on it. It has like a grip on me, like a deep grip. And I'm enslaved to it. And this is where he says, the power of the spirit can come and set us free. Yeah. And that's what we need. When you say, God, set me free. And you will be free indeed. That is what he does. Guys, I want to be liberated from this life. I want to not be so tangled up in it and drowning in it and feeling safe in it and secure in it. I want it to be found in him, my safety and security and hope all built on him. It just pulls me so tightly. I mean, I can't be the only one. I'm tired of this. I want Christ to set me free and I want to surrender it all so I can say, I'll go anywhere. I want to go anywhere for him. I want to just give it all to him because I know things have a hold of me. God set us free. Set us free. Let us see how wonderful you are. Let us come close to you. Let us come close to you and set us free. And the call, come and lay down your life God, I want to lay my life down next to you because you laid your down for me. And God, for those that are far off, let them see the love in your eyes and draw near and encounter you for the first time. God, all, let us all just let go and fall into your arms and fall into you. Let us just trust in you, God.